to Del Arme, the Bolognese podcast, where we discuss the intricacies of the Bolognese tradition. Today's guest is Martin of Schildschwach Potsdam. This is episode one of Bolognese Foundation. Today we're going to be discussing the fundamentals of Bolognese swordsmanship. What is Bolognese? Is it pasta sauce or is it fencing? Somebody run with that. I mean, for me, it's a little bit of both. But in the end, uh, I think that when they're prepared or executed the right way, both are always delicious, tasteful, and an expression of art. That's my yeah, I think it's, it's really one of the best fields to study historical fencing, really. Because not only do you have many sources, sources that give you a good amount of data to work from, but it also has a side sword, which is just the best sword fighting it system ever. Yep. Yeah, really. yeah, most beautiful, for sure. So for me, Bolognese swordsmanship and fencing represents the pinnacle of swordsmanship. So knowledge and understanding grew and grew and grew into about the early 1500s, and then guns came along, and they wanted to basically simplify and simplify and simplify and destroy all that knowledge. And so Bolognese captures that snapshot of swordsmanship at its very peak. That's a pretty controversial take there, Stephen. You're going to make some rapier people really mad. (laughs) Yeah, but that's really it. Well, I was talking about swordsmanship, not rapier fencing. (laughs) Yeah, but the side sword has a a thrusting game like rapier. It has a cutting game like saber. It has Mm -hmm. grappling, wrestling. Has lots yep. of companion weapons like shield, yep. cape, dagger, second sword. So what's yep. not to love? What is not to love? Yeah, rapier yeah, no, fencing that's... is just one step above foil fencing, really. So right, yeah, yeah. But before long, the spurgeon comes in, and then the sword is officially <laughs> dead. Right. Might as well just be start whacking each other Thanks with car side antennas. Swords, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. So I, I, mean, I actually, I, I fundamentally agree with you there. Um, I think that you know. It, it really does represent like the totality of the art. So let's talk about who the Bolognese authors are. Um, you know, I think a lot of times they're kind of, there's a divide in the community at writ large where sometimes you'll hear this referred to as Northern Italian fencing and they'll kind of group all of the Italian authors in the 16th century together. And then sometimes you hear it referred to as Bolognese fencing. So why do we kind of go for Bolognese fencing and who are we really focusing on? Cool. Um, so my take is there are some unique things, uh, in Bolognese fencing that I have not seen in other arts. Uh, two things in particular, A, is the emphasis on the use of the false edge with the one-handed sword. Um, I haven't really seen that in any other 15th century or 16th century arts. I mean, it's there, but it's not built, baked into like the DNA of it. And the other thing is the use of the, um... The posture, so the other 16th century arts that I'm aware of mostly focus on the inline kind of rapier posture, you know, right shoulder, right knee, right foot at the opponent. And Bolognese uses the kind of earlier wrestling posture, so you have that posture, and then you have the chest open posture. So those are the two things that I think um, make Bolognese Bolognese. Yeah, I really think there's a lot of shared terminology, which makes them like really complement each other. And also a lot of the tactic concepts, they shift a bit to, uh, during times, like mm-hmm. in the earlier manuscripts, like uh, in Achille Marozzo and Antonio Manciolini, we have more that flowy kind of uh, approach to combat, while later with uh, Giovanni Della Gocchia, it's more to the point, really. So, yeah, but it's a really interesting set of sources that uh, was also written for a wide audience. So that makes them really interesting as well. Yeah, so let's go ahead and go through kind of author by author and just give a, like a brief take of how we view like each author, just so that way people have a reference. So yeah. if they're looking for a specific text that they want to get into, they kind of have a framework of like which ones might be better, what each text kind of provides. So, um, you know, to start out, we've got Achille Marazzo, uh, who published his uh, Opera Nova, and it was published in 1536 in Modena, Italy. So how do you guys view uh, Achille Marazzo? Yeah, so for uh, me, it's 
definitely the most beautiful manuscript. It's also probably the most complete one, but it, it's, it's not written for us, right? It was written for his son who already knew all the stuff, who might have uh, opened or might have had to open a new school of fencing. So it's more like fencing drills and really the meaning, well, that left was left for us to figure it out. So that makes it really hard as a beginning manual for us. So I think Achille Marozzo is the smorgasbord or the buffet and uh, he has all the tasty little treats. Uh, but he doesn't really package it well, doesn't describe things well, sort of. You have to go through it and figure it out yourself. He's also semi-literate at best, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Jarek did one hell of a job in turning that into usable English, but he is he is definitely the worst writer of the entire bunch, and it shows. Yeah, I think I definitely see Murazzo as being sort of an advanced text. I think that you need perspective from other authors to really grasp what it is that he's doing. Um, the analogy that I like to use is that um, both the Anonimo and uh, Murazzo, and we can go ahead and talk about the Anonimo next here, um, represent kind of what I would say is like somebody showing you a masterpiece, right? Imagine you're at a wine by design. I don't know if they have right. those in, in Germany, Martin. Do they do that where, you know, all the like middle-aged ladies get together and, and go and drink wine and paint? Like, and do they do that over in Berlin? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so not in my circles at least, but yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, yeah, sure yeah, they yeah. do. But you know what I'm, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? So it's like, I, I see it like, it's like if you go to a wine and design, imagine we're all going to a wine and design and they, they bring and they like, they hold up uh, like a Da Vinci, right? And they're just like, okay, I want you to recreate this. That's Murazzo. Murazzo is showing you the masterpiece and saying, recreate right. it, right? Whereas I see other authors um, like uh, Dalla Gauthier and Manciolino as kind of giving you, teaching you the, the techniques, the brush strokes. Yeah. And like the, the finer Fencing aspects. for dummies in the 16th century version. Yeah, they, they give you like the core foundation that you need. Yeah. And then you can take that into like some of the more advanced authors. So yeah, um, let's talk about the Anonymo. So we've got the Anonymous. Best book uh, in the book. Uh, best of all the Bolognese books by far. <laughs> You're not biased at all. <laughs> not in the least bit. Nope. <laughs> so the Anonymo, as we often call it, is just a nickname. Um, it is called the Anonimo because it was written by an anonymous author. The manuscript name is MSS Ravenna M345 and 346. Um, and you're oftentimes going to hear it referred to as the Anonimo. The Anonimo is not the name of somebody, uh, as I think it's sometimes uh, misrepresented. Um, it is it is just the uh, a way of saying that it is like it's the anonymous author. Right. So. It's a handwritten manuscript from the 16th yeah. century date beyond that is unclear yeah so how do you feel it uh view it martin yeah well sometimes i doubt if it's really bolognese to be honest oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> because yeah Brutal. i'm a scientist and we don't have like clear proof evidence that it's from bologna but because also it was uh, discovered in ravenna so certainly it has like the same kind of language and the same kind of terms that are used in the other earlier um, Bolognese texts and also in Giovanni della Gocchia. It's also really, it's really extensive. <laughs> Let's say it yeah. like that. <laughs> it really has a lot of cool stuff in it, but it's also a bit of a disorganized mess. <laughs> yeah. That's really yeah. It so does have the advantage of it works though, unlike della Gocchia. <laughs> <laughs> della Gocchia is like, throw the falso and the madrido. Okay, well, what if he backs up? What if he does something else? What if he just counterattacks into? No, we're not. We're not talking. So, um, <laughs> oh man, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> this is going to be yeah, it really is. This is going to be great. <laughs> um, with the Anonymo in particular, um, I I, th I see it like it's it's a dictionary of plays. You know, like again, it's it's somebody holding up a masterpiece, and you you kind of have to have that foundation. Um, in a way, I, I do disagree about like whether or not like it has dubious origins because of all the texts, uh, especially if you read through like the foundational material in its introduction, there's so many parallels and like almost like like points where he's directly lifting 
like things that Manchialino says are foundational things and then putting it into the text. And then another thing that I see, the reason why I see this as like Bolognese fencing rather than um, kind of like north, just basic northern Italian fencing is especially amongst these uh, sort of core five authors, uh, and I do include Vigiani and in, in the core five authors, is that um, they, they have a shared language, right? So you can, for the most part, there are some differences between different authors, but for the most part, you can read through every single source and once we go through a lot of these terms, you'll see that there's agreement between what the actions are, what the names of actions are, um, except for Vigiani, who's a, a reformer, but still refers to like the terms that are from the, the Bolognese tradition. Um, and so you have this kind of common language. And so that's how I group them together is they share that common language. Well, that also brought up the other thing I think that is defining of Bolognese swordsmanship is the extensive use of passing footwork even with the sword in one hand uh, without a shield. That's that's very unusual for so much passing footwork to be. And I think that's also another thing that you can then look at the Anonimo and see that with uh, Marozzo and with Manciolino and Dalagocchie is the extensive use of passing footwork. Um, the big difference, I think, for the Anonimo is that it's handwritten, so it never had to go through the economics of printing. So had Manchelino not had to pay by the page to have his book printed, we don't really know all of what he would have put in there. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, he probably did leave a lot in the cutting table, and that's probably why his like brief sections. So let's talk about Antonio Manchelino. So uh, Manchelino's Opera Nova was first published in 1531. Um it may have been published before that, um, sometime around 1522 or 1523, given the dedication um, of his patron. Um, and it was printed in Venice, Italy. Um, so, Martin, how do you see Antonio Manciolino? Yeah, I think it's it's like Morozzo, but better, <laughs> especially <laughs> for beginners. <laughs> yeah. He has a lot of great stuff, especially on Sword and Buckler, but... Like overall, his his work still feels very like practice drills, right? And he needed to save words, or I don't know, but sometimes his descriptions are really sparse. So that's kind of unfortunate. I would really love if he had just written like double the pages instead of that tiny little uh, book. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. much agree there. He needed a better patron. Guido Rangoni was supporting Achille Morozzo, so presumably. So, yeah, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but Don Luis Fernandez de Cordoba was quite rich. Right. He was going to have... He may not have cared very much for what Manchelino did, and we don't even know if Manchelino was his... So... But I guess we shouldn't go down that rabbit hole. Well, just briefly, just briefly, because okay. this is All interesting. Right. All right. So he, um, he actually commissioned uh, uh, Michelangelo to basically carve him a mausoleum like think like taj mahal uh -huh. level mausoleum in naples very nice but then you know michelangelo was like dude that's ridiculous i'm not gonna <laughs> i'm not gonna spend the rest of my life building you a mausoleum and he's like <laughs> i mean come on man but that's how much money he had it was yeah. it was stupid it was yeah. stupid how much money he had. um so yeah I, so i think manchelino is probably a, the best place to start for beginners so Menchelino and Dalagokie. So Dalagokie is pretty good for once you're a beginner when you just want to get the basic feel of how to do things with a single-handed sword. And then if you want to learn how to do anything else, it's you want to start training with two hands as quickly as possible. And I learned more from doing Menchelino's Assaulty than I learned probably from almost. Especially when you approach it from uh, this is supposed to work and you're supposed to be able to use this to hit people, it really opens up the body positioning and the tactics and this footwork. Yeah, so I see... Like Manchialino, I, I, I tend to group the earlier authors together. And then I see Dalagokie kind of representing uh, like a later subset. So he, mm -hmm. to me, Dalagokie kind of stands on his own. He represents a sort yeah. of a later evolution. And he, he speaks to that in his introduction. So he's honest about the fact that he's changing the art to kind of meet fencing at the time, which is in the 1570s, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um when I see Manchialino, however, I see him as almost like a pathway to get into the intricacies of Morato, mm -hmm. and I see him as a pathway to get into the intricacies of the Anonimo. So mm -hmm. I see him as a, like a really good sort of... Um, gateway drug. 
Yeah, he's a gateway yeah. drug to to Marazzo yeah. and the Anonimo. So, you know, if you want to get high on on the the craziness of the Anonimo or get drunk on Marazzo, then you Mangiolino <laughs> is your drug of choice. So, I love yeah. it. Love it. All right. So, um, let's talk about Giovanni Della Gocchier. Um, you know, uh, his art of fencing uh, was first published in 1572 in Venice, Italy. Um, and uh, I think, you know, to really kind of understand Della Gocchier, we probably need to ask the expert here, which is yeah. Martin. Break it down for us, man. Yeah, so uh, my opinion, but it's really the best <laughs> Bolognese text, of course. But uh, he really speaks to us. So for for students of the art, he doesn't speak to his own son like Achille Marozzo. He doesn't speak to the very literate uh, patrons like Antonio Manciolino. Or, and he isn't disorganized like the Anonimo, but it's a really clearly structured fencing manual that you, if you want to dive in just into the Bolognese text, it's like the perfect book for you. Sure. It has a really nice and clear introduction. Like I said, very clearly structured. And if you put all of it together, so all three books, then uh, it gives you a really nice, complete fighting system. It doesn't have, however, all of the Bolognese weapons. So that's kind of a drawback, but that makes it also good as an introduction where you can then expand your study on. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I call Dolagokia the vanilla ice cream or the cheese pizza of the Bolognese <laughs> world. You know, if you have a party and you ha you only can bring one pizza or one ice cream, that's the one you do because everybody's basically okay with it. But, you know, it lacks a lot of the spice and interestingness and abilities of all the other authors. Well, it certainly doesn't have like that flowy attitude as the earlier Bolognese masters. Mm -hmm. But especially if you combine it with the tactical advice of Angelo Vigiani, then you really see a lot of the themes popping up that were already kind of present in yeah. present in the earlier manners, uh, manuals and right. that get more postulated in the later rapier yes. text as well so you have a really nice and consistent approach to the fight that he presents right yeah yeah i, I generally agree with that i think you know dalagoke um i've i've gone through spurts of of spending lots of time with dalagoke and then kind of going away from dalagoke specifically to get into uh, Manciolino, uh, because I think my early foundation was, was Della Gocchi. Um, but I do, I do see, and I've, I've actually, um, I think this was from, I'm not, I can't remember where I got this from. Um, but combining a lot of, uh, the body mechanics of Vigiani into Della Gocchi has been a lot of fun, especially going through his Assaulty. Um, and I found that like to be a really enterprising exercise of just kind of like, exploring deeper body mechanics and using things that he teaches to kind of explore deeper body mechanics. So I've, I've actually started to kind of get back together with Dalagoke a little bit after spending some time away. <laughs> we're going on a few dates with Dalagoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're just, you know, we're holding Letting hands. him buy you dinner. <laughs> yeah. So, um, to kind of segue into that, you know, talking about body mechanics, um, Angelo Vigiani, um, he published his treatise, uh, called the fencing or the scaramo um for in uh, 1575 it was first published which was 15 years after his death uh he had asked his brother um to publish his treatise um 15 years after he died and so it was originally completed in 1551 but it was published in 1575 and it was published posthumously in venice italy so uh martin what do you think about vigiani yeah vigiani is like like the the best book you want to study if you just want to dive in Bolognese tech, uh, tactics and body mechanics, hands down. He has a great reference in that he dedicated his, uh, his text to Charles V, so uh, the emperor of the Holy uh, Roman Empire. So really know that that dude knew his stuff, so that makes it really interesting text. And yeah, well, he is from Bologna. He kind of, I think, got sick with the terminology. <laughs> so yeah. he reforms it all over again, making it even more complicated. <laughs> but he also conveys really nice uh, tactical insights in that, uh, in that new framing of that system. How about you, Stephen? Mm, I, I, I don't think it's right to call Vijani a master. He's kind of like a quartermaster, half master. I mean, he's, 
he knows something, but basically his primary contribution to the Bolognese canon is a very detailed description of how to throw an imbricata. That's basically what he does. It's great. It's nice that we have the information in such excruciating detail so that we can replicate the imbricata and understand the principles there, there too. However, he just doesn't really do much besides that. He has, you know, he shows guards, but doesn't really explain what to do with them. And he devotes his, you know, his main thing is the imbricata followed by going into head guard, guardi di testa, followed by an imbricata again, which is, you know, it's great. I mean, that's, that's a great bread and butter technique. Um, but I don't think that's enough to justify calling him. Um, he's, he's like a, an assistant master. Well, true. He uh, just describes his one perfect play to us. But also he ha uh, presents some deviations and also like the common way of fencing and how it just fails against feints. Like if you try to parry, well, then you're always open to a feint. He also presents us a really nice tactical approach presenting certain advantages that you are striving for in a sword fight that are really if we look at the other texts, yeah, are present yeah, there as okay. well, but he really right. spills it out. He so does. He does detail that, the advantages. That's a very good yeah. point, Martin. So he does two things. So that's you know he's a really good assistant. Yeah. After Dalagotia, <laughs> go read Angelo Vigiani, <laughs> <laughs> then go back to Dalagotia. <laughs> so um, I see. I see Angelo Vigiani as the Rosetta Stone of Bolognese fencing, both All from right. his All perspective right. of body mechanics, but also his explanation of things like tempo, which I think is the best explanation. Um, also, I think that his naming of the guards as a ref, like kind of being a reformer, and obviously he was doing that because he was writing to a German audience, right? He's he's writing that for the court of the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, mm -hmm. and probably the Bavarian court in particular, because he references right. um, one of the, the Bavarian uh, dukes um, as being one of his like famous fencing uh, people who do this. And um, so he's, he's writing this for an audience that isn't a native Italian audience. So he recognizes that he has to, instead of convey the sort of uh, the meaning or the name of the guards that would have some sort of a... Uh, like a local connection, he conveys them in a way that describes them for what they tactically are. So it's a offensive guard. If your point is online, it's a, it's a imperfect offensive guard. If your point is offline and his high and low, and we'll get into that when we talk about the guard specifically, because I think that he's a really good way of understanding the depth of the guards and what they mean and what they do. Um, but just know that that's my feeling about him is that he kind of represents that Rosetta Stone. So if you want to have a deeper look at the intricacies of the Bolognese tradition, then Vigiani's your guy. Definitely agree with that. We should actually just put out a primer on the, on his stuff so you don't actually go to have to go to the trouble of reading Vigiani because we you can pretty much reduce everything he has into a couple of nice bullet points. It, it's very valuable to have those bullet points. But right. that might Which, be a useful just so quick and handy this, guide to Vigiani. Yeah, on this on this podcast, um, all of the resources that I provided for you guys um, will be provided for our audience. So right. um, that document that I made about the guards, is, which is basically just breaking down Vigiani's approach using Marazzo and Mancilino, that'll be in there. All right, so um, real quick, before we move on and kind of move away from the authors, uh, Darty or DeLuca? Who's the founder of the tradition? Mark? I actually don't think there is a founder of that tradition because even the terminology, well, that dates back to Fiora in certain guard names as well. The names of the strike date back. So I don't really think there's a, a founder that at least we could name, right, from our perspective today. But certainly all these uh, masters share like a certain kind of root, which just can be explained by evolution of uh, of exercise, of fencing, of fighting. Okay. Yeah. How about you, Stephen? Well, I'm going to totally disagree. Um, I'm going to go with Darty uh, because Darty was a mathematician and geometry. And when I teach Bolognese, it, it, I constantly teach the beginners that it's basically all a matter of geometry and creating favorable geometry. I haven't seen that kind of geometry in for the most part, in works like Fiori or in the early German ones, which were more like be strong or be soft and then go around and whatever. 
and, and less about actually moving sideways to capture the advantageous angle and then work from that. So I think Darty laid down the brought the geometry to fencing. Um, Bologna had the advantage of a having lots of really smart people and then having also students from all over Europe bringing their arts in so that they could create this sort of unique synthesis of the best of everywhere. And then I think uh, De Luca uh, was the one who kind of really put the system together in a better. I'm going with Darty as the cool mythological. What about you, Joshua? Yeah, and we'll have some some good information coming out on Darty later. I actually found some some really good details doing some research. Um, but uh, I I personally think that it's De Luca. So um, you know, I kind of trace this back to when Stephen and I were kind of combing through uh, Ghiridaki, and we we found that we we had uh, Annabelle Bentivoglio, who is Guido Rangoni's uncle, where Rangoni is Marazzo's patron and schoolmate. Um, they talk about um, having attended uh, De Luca's school together. Um, and establishing a school for the training of arms for his closest knights in the year 1496 um, in the in the city of Bologna at Palazzo Borgio uh, della Paglia. Um, and he named it the Little Casino, or the Casino, the which yeah. is the Little House, yeah. And so I've got, um, I kind of see, because of the sort of proximity, the close proximity, I think the only named person that we have that links a lot of these characters together um, is De Luca. And it does seem like, you know, it's, there's kind of like this, even this, uh, sort of redundant nomenclature that's used. We know we don't have De Luca's, um, fencing treatise, but we know that it was called the, uh, uh, opera schermo. So it was, uh, like the, the work on fencing. And then we have Manciolino and Marazzo both pick up on that and provide a new work of the new schermo, right? right? So they, they kind of like run with that that common nomenclature. So to me, that represents something that's kind of a sameness, um, and that's that's my opinion. So I run cool. with Deluca. All so, right, so hey, we've all got disagree. three different Fantastic. opinions. I love it. So, so yeah. <laughs> what do you think, listener? <laughs> but that's good, right? Because a lot of times, and I think this is important to understand, as people are kind of getting into this, you're going to run into situations where there's not a consensus, and it's okay to come up and formulate and look through specific things to you know, develop your own ideas around things that are, exist within the system, um, as you develop that understanding and to, to disagree with people. Cause, um, I think that, you know, we could all kind of learn from each other's perspectives. Yeah. And I think if you're not disagreeing, then that means you're not thinking. I mean, you shouldn't, agree. you shouldn't agree with everything that somebody else is putting out there. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully people will disagree with what we say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our advantage is that most of these hypotheses aren't falsifiable so as a scientist they don't have a lot of value but no <laughs> also, i love it i love it <laughs> yeah yeah well but certainly everyone can have their opinion <laughs> yep that's right right and that's that's kind of the beautiful thing is like i mean really you can you can say that this was founded by aliens and really nobody can <laughs> provide any sort of contention right nope <laughs> And if it's a cooler story, it might be the one that actually sticks. Yeah. So real quick before we move on, I have a, a prevailing theory going back to uh, to Vigiani. So Vigiani makes this really off statement, right? He says that Germans, when they're fighting one another, will take turns striking at each other, right? And um, I've got this wild theory that because of Ray Enzo and the connection of the Bentivoglio family with Ray Enzo, that they considered themselves descendants of the Hohestofen, which were like the original uh, emperors, like Holy Roman emperors, that when Vigiani says German fencing, he's referencing Bolognese fencing. Interesting theory, Joshua. It's a wild we're theory. Gonna have yeah. to, we're going to have to go with uh, it's not <laughs> verifiable, as uh, Martin says. I think that that's probably the best thing that we can say about that. Aliens, man. Aliens. Aliens <laughs> All right, so um, now that we've created some sort of contention amongst ourselves, let's talk about ways of attacking. <laughs> So um, basically, you know, Mandrito Reverso Fendente, oh my. Um, let's start with descending cuts. Um, what is a Mandrito, Martin? Yeah, so the first and most important thing about that terminology is that it's actually not about talking about right and left. Certainly, back then, they meant with a dritto, the true side, the right side, <laughs> But for a left-hander, that's just the left side, right? Yep. So there are beautiful, sinister people around there. So what that terminology <sighs> allows fence, us... Though? 
what that terminology allows us is to talk about motion in a very consistent way, not depending on which uh, sword actually hold, uh, which hand actually holds the sword or the other training device. So that's really nice. And the mandrito, that's a strike that originates from your true side, your dominant side. For so for the right hander, it's from the right side. Yeah, it's a forehand. Like in tennis. Yep. I was trying to convince the guys in my group to start calling it a forehand, but they like to, they want to stick with Mandrita. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think there's, there's general consensus. Um, the one thing that there's not really consensus with amongst the text between uh, the four principal or the five principal authors uh, is whether or not the Mandrito needs to go all the way through, as in it starts from your true side and goes to the opposite side. So whether or not the arm crosses the body. Or in this case, whether or not it goes from right to left, just for the sake of simplicity. Um, sometimes, um, I think especially, you know, Murato is very vague when it comes to describing the cuts and giving that basic action. Again, he's kind of relating that information, like what Martin was saying um, to his son, Sebastian, who would have had already internalized a lot of the basic knowledge here. Um, so when it comes to Murato's basic advice, a lot of it is predicated more around how to run a business, which is not very helpful here. Whereas Manciolino, Dalagoke, Vigiani, and, and the Anonimo all do give us really good information. Um, and uh, Manciolino talks about, like, he actually gives us, like, the trajectory of the cut, where Morazzo just says, study the image that I gave you, which is his segno, which is a picture of a guy getting cut in, like, five. It's actually behind Martin right now, which is perfect. You, Our listeners can't see it, but I, we certainly can. Um <laughs> So Manciolino gives us uh, a, what he says is the natural mandrito, um, and he says that it goes from the ear down through the knee, which is actually uh, a fairly steep cut. And we'll talk about the steepness of cuts here in a little bit. But Manciolino also says that as long as it originates from the right side, it's a mandrito. Yep. Um, Delagoquie says uh, it's called that because it originates from the right side. Um, Vigiani says these blows initiate from the right side of the body, both with the right forward and the left, um, and we'll call them mandritos, having their origin from the right side, um, whether from the top or the bottom, um, these blows have their endings on the left side. So there, Vigiani kind of gives this qualifier that they do end um, having gone across. And then the Anonimo says that the mandrito is a cut that proceeds across the enemy from the enemy's left, from, his, from your right, basically. Um, and is most suitably made by cutting his left ear to his right knee. So there we have consensus with Manciolino from the Anonimo, um, where he says that it's going from the ear down through the knee, which is a pretty steep cut. Yeah. It's about what, 60 degrees, right? Uh, it's about 70 degrees. So I did the math. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you should have seen awesome. me. <laughs> awesome. I, I love the, it. <laughs> I was in the laboratory and uh, and I had a tape measure out and I, I, was, I was measuring like <laughs> my ear all the way down, right, to my knee. And I was like, okay, so then uh, if, I'm, if I'm going from my ear down to my knee, that's an angle. So then I have a straight angle basically going uh -huh. up my side. So I figured right. out what the length of that was. Yeah. And then I plugged it in, did a little bit of trigonometry, and I found out that that's 70 degrees. So Katoa, man. They tell you <laughs> you're never going to use trig. Uh, it has its uses. Yeah. Right on. I, All right, so 70 degrees is the, is the angle we want for a proper mandrito. Yeah, for a natural cut. So that's what they would consider like a natural cut. Um, yeah, and I think that's really important to also keep in mind because mandrito and also dirito on itself are just also shortcuts for describing that kind of motion, right? So yeah. like you said, it's the most natural thing to do, but it also could be specified to be on another angle. And most often they give us that angle with another verb or another adjective, to be fair. Um, but sometimes they don't, and it's on us to figure it out. <clears throat> yeah, and, it, and sometimes another thing is that it's not necessarily clear whether we're throwing a mandrito or a reverso, and you know the source just kind of throws what is closest to what it is. So, yeah, in practicality, you're not. It's not necessarily always going to work like a perfect natural cut, and you're kind of guessing really whether it's a mandrito or. A reverso. Yeah, I think something that's interesting here that kind of helps. Um, and could help with interpretation too, is uh, as moderns, we have a tendency to think of things as absolutes, mm -hmm. whereas the Renaissance yeah. and medieval mindset would have not believed in absolutes. They would have thought that that was a really foreign concept, this idea of like thinking of everything as absolutes. Um, and therefore, when we say, you know, when they say a natural cut is 70 degrees, 
they're just saying like that's probably when you like um when an author says something like when they say a natural cut like you give somebody a sword for the first time their cut is most likely going to go right. through 70 degrees right um it might even be that that's the most effective cut but usually the cut and the angulation of the cut can be relative to the target or mm -hmm to where your opponent's sword is at. And therefore right. there's some ambiguity there and it's not a definitive or a definite, which is, I think, um, what we have a tendency to kind of become closed minded as moderns right. um, and, and kind of lose some perspective there. I think the important thing is just to recognize that it, although it's diagonal, it's more vertical than it is horizontal. So it is more yes. than 45 degrees. Yep, yep, I agree with that. Um, so Martin, what is a reversal? Yeah, basically it's just a reverse cut, so it's okay. from the non-dominant side, so for the usual right-hander, it's from the left to the right. Yeah, I agree with that. How about you, Steven? Uh, yeah, it's a backhand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, I hate Yeah, which is... <laughs> <laughs> so... There's, of course, um, a lot of times with the way that this will be framed by uh, the, the authors is that they will basically just say it's the reverse or the opposite, right? So they say, you know, if you deliver the opposite cut, this is from Manciolino of a Mandrito, that is aimed at his right side, high to low, this is a reverso. So thanks, Manciolino. It's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Just do the opposite. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, Morazzo just tells you to say a segno. Um, Delacocchia says, but uh, but reversi are named such because they are the opposite of the dridi. So again, we just have, it's the opposite, beginning on the left side and ending on the right. So again, we've got that sort of cross body cut, the thing that's going to kind of pull through. So we've got this almost an X shape if we were to lay these two cuts mm -hmm. over top of one another. Um, Vigiani says, and all the blows that originate from the left side of the body and terminate on the right side, both from high and low, as well as from low to high, should be called reversi. And it is called reversi because it springs from the corner opposite from the drito. So again, it's just the opposite. Um, and the uh, Anonimo says, one does the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so Pitty. just for... <laughs> yeah, just for for complete like agreement, <laughs> it's the opposite of the mandrito. So perfect. Uh, all right. So what is a fendente, Martin? Yeah. So that's basically a cut that's coming straight down towards the opponent from head to toe, or sometimes from head to the hip. It's a really steep angle, and sometimes it's even discussed if that cut really comes from the right or to the left. But uh, more often than not, I think the Bolognese authors agree that even if it's a fendente, it still comes from either the right or for, from the left. How about you, Stephen? Mm, I think fendente is tricky. Um, so I think the key thing about fendente versus mandrito and reverso is the fendente does not necessarily require a mezza volta di mano or mezza volta di col corpo. So you don't necessarily have to turn your body to make it, whereas a mandrito and reverso generally are going to require a turn of the hips, uh, which is, as the anonimo says, is the cornerstone of the art of Bolognese. Getting those hip turns and everything in there. Yeah, maybe we should talk about that once we get to the end of the cut section, is, is kind of incorporating the hips and the feet in, in delivering cuts. I think that would be a good foundational thing. Um, I'm going to put a pin in that um, because I think that is important. So... Generally, I, I think it's just, you know, I think of a fendente as a cut that's uh, straight down the middle. Um, you know, Manciolino says, if you lift your sword and place it in the middle of the two aforementioned cuts, which would be between a, a mandrito and a reverso, um, so you just put your sword in the middle of the two, um, atop the opponent's head, this is a fendente. Um, Murazzo tells you to study his senio. <laughs> Uh, Delicoque <laughs> says uh, it's called a fendente because it cleaves from the head to the feet in a straight line, um, which is interesting because one of the things that Marazzo defines with his senio is that he has a mandrito fendente and a reverso fendente. And here we have some agreement between Delicoque and Marazzo in that he says it's just as long as it goes from the kind of the head to the feet in a straight line, it doesn't matter where it's at, right? Whereas right. Manchiolino is kind of giving this oddly specific thing where he's saying it's between the Mandrito and the Reverso, or maybe that is am kind of ambiguous because you have roughly 60 degrees of potential uh, target that you can cut through. 
And he does yes. have two Reverso Fendentes in his book, I think. One in the single hand sword section, if memory serves, and another one in the Assaulty of the Sword and Small Buckler. Mm-hmm. So that's he does recognize that it can also be just a cutting angle, as well as whatever else it is. Yeah, and I think that's actually, so you, I think you pick up on a good point there, Stephen, is it's sometimes it's easier to think of these things as just kind of angulation mm-hmm. of the cut. Um, sometimes that's a, a, a trap, though, right? Especially when you're thinking of just Mandrito and Reverso, it can be a trap because you could have a Fendente that's called a Mandrito sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, sometimes with the named cut, where it's it's outside of like those two core cuts, either a cut from the right or a left, mm-hmm. if you have a, an, a qualifier like Fendente or a Stromazzone, which we'll talk about in a second because there's a little bit of contention there, um, is that it's going to be, you're just providing that reference. I think what, what Martin referenced earlier is sometimes you do have those qualifiers like um, Squalombrato or Fenden. Um, so that was right. that was good. So, um, you know, Vigian, Vigiani says that the Fendente descends or ascends through a straight line. So there we have a rising Fendente, which is interesting. Um, usually that's called a Montante. Yeah, Vigiani calls it the Fendente Ascendante. So yeah. a rising Fendente. He also uh, goes a little bit on a rant on that directional uh, stuff that you talked about earlier. Like if we talk about moving in space, we basically can talk, uh, we can move into six directions, which is left, right, up, mm-hmm. down, and forward and backwards. But then he goes, well, yeah, but I don't like my terminology, so we'll just stick it like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Fendente is really about that up and down motion. So for him, yep. it's the downward Fendente and an ascending Fendente. Yeah, and then the Anonimo again agrees specifically with Manchiolino in that he says the Fendente is made by lifting the sword to strike directly under the enemy's head. But that also kind of goes to a little bit of sort of the controversy that you picked up on there, where it could be that it's simply just like, it doesn't involve the hips, but it's kind of that, that push cut action. Um, but that's probably a little too much for this <laughs> specific episode. Sure. So yep. um, what about the stramazone or tramazone? Um, I think sometimes we hear both stramazone, we hear tramazone, we hear... Um, all sorts of things with this. I mean, uh, <laughs> so Martin, what, what is this cut? Yeah, sometimes also in a manner of a mulinello or mulinetto. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, basically a cut that resolves around your wrist like a little millstone, <laughs> mm-hmm. like they described it. So it really is a cut that is has its central point in your wrist. So by turning your shoulder and your forearm, basically uh, loosening up, your grip at some point you can move that sword around your hand without moving that hand too much it's easier uh, from the right side so from the true side that is as it is from the reverso side where you sometimes need to bend the elbow a bit to actually make that cut but yeah basically it's a really quick cut that is um, especially used as like a kind of follow-up action when you have your sword extended yeah how about you steven I think that pretty much covers it, man. You just turn it down, let the false edge go down, spin that thing around, and pop, usually throw two at a time. Yeah. So one thing that I find is really interesting is if you look at sort of this, uh, again, looking for this matter of agreement between the different authors, is they often refer to the Traumazzone and Straumazzone um, as a fendente. So the cutting angulation is that mm-hmm. straight line. So right. even though you're you're kind of giving this wheel cut action, um, the cutting line of the Stromazzone specifically is that vertical cut that's going to basically go straight down the middle of your opponent, um, which is uh, really interesting. Um, unless they give you some other qualifier to cho- sort of change that angulation, the default should be a straight cut. Um, yeah, I think Dalagoke is the one. He says it's like a little mill or like a little wheel um Marazzo typically uses the qualifier to let you know that it's a um like a like it's he says it's like a fendente um with his reverso traumazone he says that's when he says it's like a mulinello um and he's um that one's a, a probably a little complex for what we're trying to do here to try to describe that but generally what you end up seeing is that the point turned down in a way and i'll um 
I'll kind of read through the anonymous description here because he's got a really good description of what the plate is specifically. Um, but just kind of know that all of them say it's a wrist cut that's delivered like a fendente. Um, so the anonymo says there's another method that may also be called a turn of the hand. You will be set in Porta de Ferro Strata with the right foot forward, um, and that means your hand will be on the inside or kind of in the direction of like the inside of your right leg um, for Porta de Ferro Strata. Um, so that way, uh, let's see. And if you turn your sword hand so that the point faces towards the ground, and you turn your sword to your left side while making a circular turn, and then you turn your sword back into Porta de Ferro Strata, this will be called a turn of the hand. And to be done well, you should do it quickly. This attack is called a tramazzone, um, or a turn of the hand. But note that it is also a turn of the sword. Um, so one of the interesting things here is that he says it's often something that's done only with sword and buckler, which uh, is another uh, pretty interesting thing, because I think... Manchelino we do accords s- with that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's um, it it is interesting that you've got that sort of that turned down. It's it's described fairly well in terms of that hand turns down across, and so you're kind of almost turning so that way your palm is facing to the inside, and then the sword comes back around, and you're basically pulling it back into that same guard. So it's like the hand c- does that, and that's kind of the the turn of the wrist there. Yeah, Dalagotia also, also oh. uses it famously for when his sword is pushed out of the line. So, for example, mm-hmm. if my sword's pushed to my right, so towards my outside, then I'll just let the tip drop, cut around with a basically a reverso tramazzone and close that outside line, and on the other side just as well while taking a step backwards. There's also one contentious point I want to uh, get your nice. opinion on, and that is like... If we want to throw, for example, a tramazzone from the right, we can let our point drop into two directions. Basically, we can drop it on the inside and throw a strike from the right, but we could also just drop it on the outside and still strike from the right. So Mm -hmm. that's something I think that is not that clear. I agree. Um, I actually find when I am fighting with two swords, that a lot of times I will default to an outside tramazzone to deliver a mandrito. Um, and I, I think that that's probably kind of heretical and not necessarily a, a great way to like play through. But then again, I'm not 100% sure. So Manchelino so. and, and the Anonimo have a number of Fanta Molinello to throw a mandrito. So I think that's a very natural way to, to resolve. So you basically, you're just coming down like so into a, equivalent to, I think, a saber parry seven position, so a reverse hang position. Then you're coming and threaten something on the fendente line, which will pull their sword up, and then you just change the direction naturally. Very useful technique. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I just think that's what a molinello means. Molinello means it prepares on the outside, on the right yeah. side of your arm, until you turn your arm over. On the right side, and then the tramazzone prepares on the left. I guess it's room for a debate there. Yeah, sometimes I played around with... Uh... Like in Morozzo's two-handed section, he also speaks of the tramazzoncello. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe, okay, maybe that's uh, like dropping to the outside because it's maybe a smaller circle. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of an interesting idea as well. But I think it's fine to leave it uh, as an ambiguous statement. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when there is that ambiguity, so this could be a good time for us to kind of talk about like just the process of interpretation, especially when it comes to basic things is that sometimes the best course of action is to kind of stick with the default and then to, once you have like a solid interpretation for the rest of it, then come back and kind of tweak and play with variations to try to make it work to fit. So that way you have something that is successful because you don't want to do something, you know, for infinity just because you have like a fixed mindset on what it is, right? And so you have to kind of like almost put a pin in something and say, here he tells me to do a stramazzone. I'm going to default to doing this as a fendente, but I might come back and change it later because I might need to from a tactical mm-hmm. perspective, right? right? You kind of create these these pins of ambiguity, and then you can come back and address them later as you're coming through and developing your interpretations. And yeah, I think that's an import- a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry, that's a really nice approach, uh, I think. Really just focusing on the essence of the action. So, for example, dritto comes from the right, reverso comes from the left, fendente from the top, and tramazzone, well, it's around your wrist. And then go from there. One thing I think I've noticed that is helpful in interpreting and doing stuff like that is also if you can't fairly reliably pull it off in sparring context, 
then hold definitely pencil in that interpretation. Um, that's the main purpose of actually free fencing with folks is to test those interpretations. And also, I think everything should at some point kind of naturally show up in free fencing. Like you should just naturally find yourself doing many of these actions uh, because they should be somewhat intuitive. And so just keep an eye on if you do things and they regularly work. Um, that's another thing to take that and then look through the texts and see if you find something like that. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes, um, you know, and you will find those points, right? Like uh, Manchialino a lot of times doesn't give us like uh, undefined terms. Mm -hmm. Whereas an author like Murato gives us a ton of undefined <laughs> terms. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have episodes of just debating terms that, oh that Murato gives Jarek's that don't exist anywhere of, else. Yeah, Jarek's description <laughs> of trying to figure out what certain terms mean is just hilarious. It's like, clearly this dude has thought about it at such a high level for so long and still couldn't figure out, like, the squillo or something like that. <laughs> like, well, like, it could be from the specific dice used to puncture wine bottles or something like that. Something <laughs> yeah. so random like that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's... Um, Whereas you have somebody who's more of a descriptive author like Manchialino, um, where he'll he'll give you a description of actions that you know Marat or Manchialino or excuse me Marazzo okay. will give you a name for right. So right. Um, there are times where I think that uh, Manchialino gives a falso impuntanto, but he doesn't tell you it's a falso impuntanto. Right. Um, and I think that um, whereas Marazzo does, and so Manchialino just describes it and stuff like that. But we won't worry about the the falso impuntanto here. So, um, but speaking of puntanto or punto, let's talk about thrusts. So, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, you want to first talk about the body turns? Oh yeah. That's a great oh, idea. Oh yeah. Yeah. Before we get through that. Yeah. That's, that's a good we, idea. That's we'll probably need, we'll very need good that idea, here as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, the way that I see this, you guys can, or I, I'll let you lead, uh, Martin, why don't you go ahead and take that? All right. So. Like we already said, like the Mandrito covers the inside, the Reverso covers the outside, basically. And so our body position can support these motions because all in all, these motions are like the in-between between two guards. And that is something for later. But really, if we have the sword on our dominant side and we want to cut to the inside, then we want to support that motion with our whole body. So basically, we will need to start in a kind of frontal position, like my chest facing towards my opponent, and then go into like um, a position where my shoulder, only my right shoulder, is turned towards the opponent. And for the reverso, that can be said as well, but not to that of high of a degree, because if we bring our dominant shoulder back, we also always will lose reach. Cool. Yeah, how about you, Steven? Do you agree with that? Yeah, basically, I think there's there's two body positions. One is your heart is looking at your enemy, and the other one is your shoulder is looking at your enemy. And the half turn of the body is the transition between uh, those two orientations. So you're either you're turning from your heart to your shoulder facing somebody if you're throwing a mandrito, or if you're throwing a reverso, you go from the shoulder facing the enemy to the heart facing the enemy. Yeah, I agree with that. And and so the way that I, you can do that with a passing step, I think, right? So if you're, like the way that I see it is uh, you're, a lot of your strata guards, um, your or your, excuse me, not strata, a lot of your coda longa guards, um, coda longa strata specifically, would be like heart facing towards your enemy. Your hips are going to be facing towards. Right. Um, you can usually do this by going up onto the ball of the back foot. Um, and then if you were to cut in place, you can close that back foot so it goes to a 90 degree angle and now you're in Porta de Ferro Strata and that closes the hips and turns them off to the side. Um, or you can do it with a passing step. So if you are in, let's say, Cota Longa Alta, you can raise your hand, you can deliver a cut and once you have pit passed, your hips will shift. Um, and so now from instead of your fist, your hips facing to the inside, when you do the passing step, they'll now face to the outside and your cut will go through. And so right. you have you always have the hips and the shoulders kind of connected with one another. So if your hips are facing forward, your shoulders are facing forward. If your hips are facing to the side, your shoulders turn to the side. And a lot of times we see this profiling happen or at least described by 
the authors as you're turning your head to face your opponent once your body is in profile. Right. Um, and then obviously we can kind of see this in some of the images. It's it's a lot more apparent in Vigiani's images, but it is there and it does seem like it's 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 present in some of uh, uh, Morazzo's images as well. Yeah, it does. And it's uh, so I, most people get into the open position, that is the heart facing the opponent pretty naturally. Well, most people don't want to make the full rotation in order to get into Porta de Ferro because it's kind of uncomfortable. So yeah. if your opponent can see the part of your chest where your heart is, then you are not in profile enough. So if they can stab you in your heart, you haven't turned enough. Yeah, I think that's a really important point and something that we can discuss more d in detail on the guard section of that of this podcast. That's right. That's right. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, but I think we've got a pretty good amount of agreement yeah. there and and that that back foot, I think to keep in mind like when you're giving those cuts, that back foot really acts as the rudder, right? If you're if you're in a static position, that back foot should really be shifting between on the ball of the foot and then closed um, sort of the toe facing off to the side. Yeah, sometimes um, I even see like the feet and the upper torso and hips moving independently from each other because we have all like these profiled or frontal positions which with either foot forward. So basically the the focus of the feet is to bring you into the right position and right. the upper body supports all and the hips support all of your actions, your cuts, your thrusts and basically closing the line and minimizing the area that your opponent can attack, actually. And that's how we differ from the rapier kids who don't use their whole body. Ours is all about using the full power <laughs> of the hips, using your glutes for those rotations instead of just twirling a, you know, a wrist around when you want to cut. Okay, so in defense of the rapier, I'll just say that, for example, Di Grassi has a very similar body position to the Bolognese authors, and he writes oh, about the, the rapier. He's kind of Bolognese light. He's, he's from <laughs> and Modena. Also in the, yeah, true. And also the Spanish masters also have like that, yeah. that fluid motion. They cribbed motion. all the good stuff from the Bolognese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just simplified Bolognese swordsmanship. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, and also Fa Fabris. I was meaning the Italian rapier kids. Yeah, yeah uh, Savato Fabris also really likes to turn his body towards the opponent's sword. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's, the, that's advice. Um, Maybe we'll talk. We'll just, I'll save that for the for All the right. guard section. So, um, you know, kind of thrusting forward here. Um, what is a stoccata, Martin? Yeah. So basically, a stoccata is a thrust from below in the most general sense. It can origin either from the dominant side or from the non-dominant side, and it usually goes through an extended position where you are closing out the opponent's blade, and then moves back into a position where you still move, close out the opponent's blade. So you usually have that body turn in there as well. Yeah. How about you, Steven? How do you see the stoccata? Mm, I, I don't. I think they just throw that in there when they mean a thrust. I don't know that it's a... Well, certainly not in the Anonimo. Uh, I don't know that it's a specific term for a rising thrust. I think it's quite possible that you could start at shoulder height, and that might be considered a stoccata. And then there's the whole, like... You know, if it starts underhand and you're supposed to get your sword up to around shoulder height before you start stepping, it, it for me, I, th I think stoccata just means a throw. And the Bolognese authors avoid repeating themselves unless they're specific. I think there is somebody who does talk about it uh, as a, um, a thrust, but it is a thrust from the right side that is underhanded and not overhand like an imbrocata. So I see a stoccata as, as kind of the basic action of a thrust. Um, but I think that if you look at um, a few different authors, you'll see that, and I include the Anonimo in here too, because I use his stoccata trivolata as a way of him discussing something that is um, usually kind of uh, like a baked in mechanic of the stoccata, which is that it has that covering action, like what Martin was, is it, was referring to. Is it? Yeah. I think so. It's not so specified. I think we think the stoccata, you're supposed to turn your true edge against it and thrust, but it's not clear. The stoccata to me starts as a straight thrust, mm -hmm. um, and this is a, a lot of this foundation comes from. I think Vigiani clarifies this a lot, right? And it's that the stoccata comes forward as a straight thrust, and if it continues to go straight, then it becomes what we'll term later as a punta firma. Right, which means that it has no termination of the hand. So the hand doesn't turn up or it doesn't turn either palm up or palm down in the thrust. It just continues to go straight forward. 
and that's so a it's the initial firm. preparatory action of a thrust where you go from the guard position up into the middle position before you actually step extend and step what do you mean by middle position there so if you're making a thrust from cotolunga strata for example according to typical thrust theory you are supposed to move your sword up to around shoulder height and then you do your you extend and then you step so you're talking about so this, finding uh, f finding first and then sending the thrust forward yeah i mean basically almost mm -hmm. everybody who talks about the thrust talks about getting your sword up in height from the guard position and then extending forward and then following that with the step so yeah. is the stoccata then you're thinking really referring more to that original rising action up and before it reaches up here to where it would just be a punta if it starts from there yeah, so it, it starts straight. So imagine just sticking your hand out like you're extending your hand for a handshake. Uh -huh. yeah. And then it turns to cover a line. So it would okay. extend forward like it's coming forward, like you're extending a handshake. And then you turn either palm up or you turn palm down. Right? Okay. And so that's to cover the line. So a lot of times, at least from my study, it's I see that the stoccata is often used as a provocatory action. Okay. So it's used as a, prov a provocation to... This is an initial attack towards an opponent, not um, like a cover necessarily, right? Um, usually, if it's a cover, you see it described as a punta reversa, which means specifically that it's a thrust from the left, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, and therefore, I think you're, you're deliberately sort of, sort of taking that line first and then extending the sword forward. Um, and so I think the stoccata, because, again, it's a provocation, I think it starts straight forward and then it turns. And so we see that in Manchialino. He says, lastly, if you push a thrust against the opponent, this is universally called a stoccata, delivered with either foot forward, overhand, or underhand. Right. So there he's talking about that mechanic of, of okay. that turn of the hand. Um, he, Marazzo, of course, uses the stoccata and he never defines it. Um, Delagucchi says, and that which is done underhand is the stoccata. So he's just saying it's an underhand thrust. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of that high to low mechanic. Vigiani says it's a thrust or alternatively a stoccata, um, high or low, terminating then on either side, right or left. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's saying it's, it's just a thrust, but it terminates right or left. Right. And that's where I see that palm up, palm down, um, supernation and pronation uh, sort of mechanic there. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's where I get with the, the Anonimo in particular. This is where I kind of draw that parallel of him saying that you're throwing an underhand stoccata trivolata. Um, so as one of his wounding manners. And I see that when he does that, that's that provocation action. So he's basically just giving, he's using a word to describe that mechanic, which is the trivolata that that Manciolino and, and um, Vigiani specifically talk about, which is Got just it, the that drilling action. pronation supernation. Yeah, exactly, yep. And so he's just kind of like tagging that on there so that way there's no confusion, which is nice, right? That just right. makes him a more concise author. So the stoccata in itself is sometimes just a generic term for thrust, and sometimes it's more specifically the one that comes from below and is done underhand. Right. Yeah. Depending on author, too. Yep. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> um, yeah, because I don't know if we, we talked about the... Uh, oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah. So uh, one of the things, the notes that I put on here, sorry about that, I needed to read that for a second. Um, so uh, the Anonimo specifically has one part where he talks... So like when he's describing the, the Stoccata Trivolata, he says that... And then he follows that with there's the Impercata, either right or left, or the fourth way to attack with the point is the Punta Firma, which is that straight through the middle, right? And then... Um, and he says you'll you'll do that for, drive that forcefully without turning the hand. So his right. his change there with the punta firma versus the stoccata trivolata is that there's just no turn of the hand, right? That's my and so that's point, again, yeah. yeah, okay. So that that kind of like helps to kind of defend that because I think that agrees with both Vigiani and Manchialino. Okay, so um, sometimes we'll see the word punta show up, um, especially if you're looking at Murato. Um, or you'll see this kind of this word float around, or it's used as kind of uh, an adjective in some ways. Um, so what is a punta? Uh, it's a point. It's a thrust. Hit him with the the pointy end of the sword. Yeah, just yeah. I think it's sim just simple as that. Sometimes it's also a punta. It's still just the tip of the sword. Thrust them with it. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there's you can't really argue with it. <laughs> it is it is right. Like it's it's yeah. the point. So you're just kind of attacking with the point. Um, so 
now let's add some some modifiers to it. So mm-hmm. what about a punta drita? Yeah, so that would be then like uh, like the mandrito. It's a it's now a thrust from the dominant side. So it comes from the right. It hopefully closes the opponent out from the right. Sometimes it's even th- uh, tries to thrust around, but that's a more complicated thing that I usually wouldn't advise to beginners because that depends a lot on how your opponent reacts. Yeah. How about you, Steven? Um, I don't know. I never use the term punta drita. So it just means point and right. So it just would presumably mean a point that comes from your right side and goes to the middle. Yeah, yeah certainly so way where it's the new, only... You, hmm? Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so it's way less used than actually the punta reversa, which follows in a bit. So that uh, makes it also really interesting. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's a p- point from the right, usually with the palm down mm-hmm. and the knuckles up. So saving saving um, Vigiani here, because Vigiani describes it a lot, because he says, you know, there's a punta drita, a punta reversa, and he uses that as his overall qualifiers, because he's kind of obsessed with this sort of... Um, dominant non-dominant sort of Mm -hmm. methodology like that's kind of his core methodology is it either comes from the dominant side or the the non-dominant side there's only one use of the punta drita amongst dalagoki manchilino and marazzo and it is in marazzo's sword alone so um Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's like it's crazy because i think we we hear that term used a lot and it might be just from from contemporary folks using it to kind of like help describe things um but it's uh it's something that um, Marazzo does in his sword alone, where he meets with the false edge, and then he does a mezzo volta, and then he's thrusting from the right side. So he's turned his hand palm down, and so in meeting with the false edge and then turning his hand with the palm down, his hand is all the way to the right, and so he's thrusting from his dominant side, and he calls it a punta drita. So, and everybody that does sort of define what it is, because I think um, if I'm not mistaken, Vigiani or uh, Del Gokia might explain what it is. Um, I don't know. He does, I guess he doesn't. Just Vigiani does. And he says it's a thrust from the right side. So that, to me, is you know, sufficient agreement. So let's talk about the one that is used a lot. Um, let's talk about the Punta Reversa. So, uh, Martin, what's the Punta Reversa? Yeah, basically, the way more common version, which is with the palm up or the nails up sometimes or in the knuckles down. So this one usually covers your inside, but it also has like nice implications if you want to like actually cover yourself with the false edge or the cross of the false edge so it's really um like in modern or in modern fencing no in in rapier fencing we would call it a quarta yeah how about you steven i can't add to that that pretty much is self-explanatory find it with the false (laughs) edge from the left side drill and go yeah it's also commonly used as a stop thrust i think in manchalino especially Mm-hmm. He basically kind of cuts out the hole, just defend yourself in Gorda de Faccia and just tells you to thrust in a Punta Reversa, right? Mm-hmm. So um, this one, to me, I actually kind of like shook a few like foundational things that I had in my head because I think I had a notion that the Punta Reversa, um, and that was wrong. I had this notion in my head that the Punta Reversa was always going to be this sort of palm-up thrust kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but in looking at this some more... Um, the way that it's defined amongst all the authors is that it is simply just a thrust from the left. Um, and when you look at, uh, like, the Anonymous use, the only guard that he thrusts from is Gordia de Entreri, which is a left guard. Like, his hand is um, sort of shoulder height on the left-hand side, um, and he thrusts a, uh, a Punta Reversa. Uh, Mancialino's use of the Punta Reversa only comes from Sopra Brachio and Soto Brachio which would be um, underarm and overarm guards, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in, uh, in a little bit. Um, and then uh, both Vigiani and Dalla says or say that it comes from the left. So I um, thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, so yes, I'm not... I, th- I, I think yeah, it's also mechanically really sound, uh, especially in comparison to the Punta Drita, because with the Punta Reversa, you're again covering your inside. So you're going into that like profile position. Mm-hmm. And if you have pressure on your inside, then your pecs, your breast muscles basically can withstand that pressure. Mm-hmm. And these right. are usually fairly strong. Also, being in that profile means that, well, if they disengage in a round, there's very little ground for you to cover. 
to cover that side as well. And some authors do that with a false edge. Some authors turn their hands into like the punta dritta kind of motion. Um, but compared to the punta dritta, where you where you get um, so you cover your outside. So for a right hander, that's the right side, and you get pressure towards your left. Then you can only withstand that with your the muscles between your shoulders, and that's way harder. So like the punta reversa is. It's way more apt to defend yourself in that case. Yeah, and so I think I'm, I'm not 100 about the the mechanic of always doing it as a, a palm down thrust, um, but I'm not 100 sure on that. I'm gonna have to explore that further. Um, but the, it's interesting, right? That it is it is defined as a, a thrust that comes from the left. A lot of times, uh, looking at Dalagoke and Morazzo, and because they use it more than anybody else, I think like the Anonimo and Manchiolino use it very sparingly. Um, and uh, between uh, Dalagoki and Morazzo, a lot of times it's followed by a mezzomandrito. So it's like you do a cover, like a specific cover, like that, that half cut to sort of close the line, and then the sword starts to come forward. And it's, so it, it, the sword goes to the left side to kind of con control the opponent's attack, right? Imagine making a parry with a half right. cut, and then the sword comes forward, and now you've done a, a punto reversa. So it is that thrust coming from the left. And there you do have that built-in sort of palm-up mechanic, which is, like what Martin was saying, um, very mechanically sound. Uh, the palm-down mechanic on the outside when you're extending your arm out um, is always dangerous because it's a weak angle. Um, if you kind of hold your, your hand up yep. and you turn your hand palm up and you try to move your wrist side to side, uh, because of the way that your muscles are contorting and twisting, uh, it, it tightens the wrist, mm -hmm. right? Right. Whereas if you are wrist down and you try to move your wrist um, and you have that palm down, the the wrist is loose because you're not turning and, and contorting the muscles there. But if you um, have a small so buckler, it doesn't really matter. True, true. But it, it becomes a weak angle, right? right. And so that's that's the weakness of, of your body mechanics there. And of course, like what Martin was saying too, it's also about the, the larger muscle groups that you're engaging too. Like right. once you've got the pec flexing and kind of like um, under tension, then it becomes like you're creating that solid structure. Yeah, I, want to, I think Manchelino only uses it from Sopra Bracho and so only uses it with the sword and small buckler. Yeah, or and yeah. so mm -hmm. and yeah, having a weak true. angle from a when the sword and small buckler can actually be disadvantageous. It can be advantageous because it facilitates the follow up tremazoni. Yeah, so he usually so yeah from from like Sopra Bracho and Soto Bracho the overarm so. Well, I don't want to get too into the weeds before we get yeah, to yeah, kind of like defining the guards to here. like confuse people. Um, but yeah, so, but yes, you're right, uh, Stephen, in that I think he's, uh, he's generally doing it from um, what are wide guards and he's okay with the fact that he's taking a risk because he has a buckler, um, right. which a lot of times you'll see. Right. More risky actions happen when you have a secondary like <laughs> defensive implement or offensive implement in your hand. Right. Right. Yep. But I think it's good to remember that there's also a guard in the Bolognese system that is very similar to the mechanics of the Punta Riversa, and that is Guardi di Faccia. So sometimes yeah. that might just mean do a Punta Riversa. Mm -hmm. And and Manchiolino in particular um, absolutely relies on Guardi di Faccia. It is his exit and his cover for almost every single action that he gives. So if you want to be safe, you go to Guardi di Faccia and Manchiolino. Um, mm -hmm. So, all right. So let's talk about the uh, the punta firma, Martin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you said it's a thrust straight down the line. I think, especially in Marozzo, sometimes it's just a really like the word means a close thrust. You basically don't leave the guard position that you are in at all. You just step forward and you thrust them. Okay. So it can be still just done with the hands low or the hands high, depending on where the hand actually is but usually the hand is low gotcha steven yeah i mean it's not drilled so it's usually going to be yeah you're just pushing through their sword so it probably implies that you have some sort of weak angle on them or you have some sort of body positioning angle so that you're able to just push this yeah yeah and that that's that's kind of how i see it i see it as a, a thrust that kind of goes straight down the pipe um and then it lacks that termination um mostly from uh, the definitions from the Anonimo where he says that it doesn't turn. And then um, Vigiani as well, who says that it's just, it'll go straight ahead um, rather than turning up or turning down. Um, all right. 
So the punta firma is defined as that kind of straight thrust. Now let's turn to the mighty imbrocata. Great the most important and the most perfect attack, <laughs> at least to Angelo Vigiani. And <laughs> to be honest, it really is. Um, usually, by most authors, it's a downward thrust from the dominant side. But there are also, I think the Anonymo talks about it, that it can be also be delivered from the left as well. So in essence, it's a downward thrust. Also sometimes referred to as the punta sopra mano. So Stephen, what is a punta sopra mano? What does that mean in Italian? That just means an overhand thrust. Yep. And so we see that also with uh, Marazzo. And because uh, I think Marazzo only does the impercata, names the impercata one time. Yeah, and he just he says it's an overhand thrust. Um, I think the one, the two sources that use the impercata the most are the Anonimo and Dalagoke. Um, so, uh, Marazzo and Manciolino don't really use it named a lot. Um, Marazzo does name it one time, uh, but usually he just says an overhand thrust. Um, and then, uh, Manciolino describes it, but never names it. Um, I do love the Anonymous, uh, description of the, uh, like a lightning <laughs> bolt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. the sending like a great force like a, a light a bolt of lightning yep that's amazing yeah he, he so, does a lot with the imbricata a yeah. lot a lot i love how he he's really big on the imbricata from uh what is a tail guard which is just the corda lunga distesa corda lunga lunga where you let the sword go behind you like a tail guard and then it comes back up in various different ways that we'll talk about in the future to then come in with a descending thrust to their chest or their hand. It can be very, very brutal. Now, um, so Stephen, do you, when you do the imprecata, do you always do the termination aspect of it where you turn, the thrust comes in and it's like you're in a palm out position. So it's coming from high to low and then your palm turns down. So you, you basically start in like a high guard and then you finish in Porta de Ferro Strada or do you, do you So finish? I do the Imbrocata in so many different ways that I, I can't sum it up. I love the Imbrocata and I, we could do an entire episode on the Imbrocata. Uh, but I have various ways of doing where you're actually coming sometimes a little bit from below and then rising into their chest and coming down like that or... The most useful one, I think we can all kind of agree on this, is where you find their sword on the outside with your sword, wrap that false edge over the top, and then just drill that baby in. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like the feel of somebody's sword helplessly sliding out of the way as they desperately try to hold off your thrust, knowing there's nothing you can do as you drive it into their belly. Oh, it's a great feeling. Yeah. How about you, Martin? Do you usually add that sort of... Uh defensive termination aspect at the end of it where you're turning into Porta de Ferro? So that really depends on where the opponent's blade is, right? So um, I'm really surprised actually that Steven, you don't like Vijani that much because he basically gives us all the mechanics for the Imbrocata depending on where the opponent's blade is. So either, either turning, pony. not turning. <laughs> he's a one-trick pony, man. <laughs> you, you, you can either engage the blade or thrust around the blade. You could yep. thrust around shields. You could thrust yep. around armors in, armor into the neck. So it's, it's, really, it's really also a hard thrust to parry because yeah. especially if you're a right-hander and fencing against another right-hander, that thrust, it will just be a point moving towards you it's really easy to miss with your own defense with a mandrito or a reverso. So, yeah. And, and then when you do, you just succeed in putting your sword into presence so that they can drive your, your sword away with the power of their imbricata. Yeah. yeah. Another important point, because it's so hard to parry, it really doesn't entice the opponent usually to just strike you at the same time. Right. So that makes it also, like from a historical, psychological view, makes it really interesting. They have to react if they don't want to die as well. Fortunately, usually people just react by backing up and then backing up again and then backing up some more so that you can't even use the imbricata. It's, it's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, but they got shamed, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just talking about in a modern context. In the past, yeah, they're, they're, they have to suck it up and stay there. Uh, we'll shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, that's yeah. where, uh, where like, uh, the ring is for when they step oh, out. Right. <laughs> that's right. fine as well. Yeah. 
Oh, I like I like the uh, the anonymous take on that with his. Well, I think it's his twenty first play where he basically lets that impercata go to the hand. It's like he threatens the impercata and they start uh-huh. to pull away. Mm-hmm. So he thrusts that impercata to the hand and lets it go wide. So that way they come back and then he basically does, um, you know, Vigiani and Dalagoki's like. Yep sort of core mechanic of rising right. back up into it and then driving that impercata again. Yep. And so it's, it's like he so sets good. it up yeah. with that that provocation of of mm-hmm. like he knows they're going to pull away from the impercata. So once he's up there, then he attacks that shallow target so that way they c- try to counterattack and then mm-hmm. and then he just gives them the impercata again and he's like I <laughs> I'm going to get you with the impercata no matter what you do. <laughs> I'm yep. going to hit you with this play. <laughs> right. So we're going to have to talk about how to defend against the impercata in one of these future episodes so that people will stay and defend against the impercata cuz there's can be some great fencing that arises that begins with the impercata. There's a lot of really fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean th- yeah, th- one of the core I think forms that a lot of people learn, especially when they start out in, in Bolognese fencing is um, how to attack and defend in various guards from right. uh, Giovanni Dallagoke, right. uh, sort of his, his more elaborate form. And that has right. a defense against an impercata. Yes, um, cer- that's uh, certainly a cover, uh, several, of course, and yep. some are really beautiful. So yeah, uh, looking forward to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Cool. The Anonymo has some great de- guard the defenses against the impercata too. So, um, Let's talk about rising cuts. So what is a redopio? Yeah, well, if you want to throw an embracata, you need to get your sword up. And <laughs> what's better <laughs> to get your sword up than to throw a rising blow? Yeah, so basically redopio, just like fendente, is like um, another adjective that you can put on mandrito or reverso to describe the angle of the cut, usually upwards. <laughs> can also mean just to redouble to be honest. Right. But yeah, basically it. Yeah. So it is interesting. Um, some authors prefer to use the term redopio and some don't. Um, so this is one point where we could probably take a, a second to talk about like mm-hmm. different uses of various terminology, right? Um, one of the things I think early on as you're learning to kind of look at this material and develop your own understanding of the material is to look at the core foundational aspects of things like a mandrito is always a mandrito, a reverso is always a reverso. The stoccata is usually a thrust. Um, talking about a punta, it's usually a thrust. Like these, there are some fixed terms that you can kind of familiarize yourself with. Um, and then there are some that are sort of those qualifiers, right? And they're the add on type things. And here, a redopio um, would be sort of that one of those named actions, right? Whereas, the good thing about the redopio in particular is it's defined as a true as true edge rising blow. When it's not used, um, the authors that don't use it, like Anonimo and Manchiolino, um, both just tell you to throw a rising true edge. Um, so they'll say throw a rising mandrito or a rising reverso. And if they tell you to throw a rising mandrito or a rising reverso, they're telling you to do it with the true edge of the sword. So um, having talked about the true edge where it sometimes gets a little more complicated is when we start talking about throwing cuts with the false edge. The um, real edge. Right. And we should probably talk about what the true edge and the false edge are, since this is a beginner episode, because I think sometimes that can get confusing for people as well. So, Martin, what's the true edge of the sword? Yeah, so true edge, false edge, that's basically the first heading of uh, Giovanni della Gocchia. And it's basically if you put the sword in your hand and you have one edge in line basically with your second knuckles and the other edge is basically towards the base of your thumb and usually if you just point it in a relaxed fashion forward then the true edge will be in line with your second knuckles so that will be pointing downwards and the false edge will be pointing upwards so it's on the side of the base of your thumb. The falso is then uh, employing that false edge which is really awesome and kind of unique to like those systems uh, deploying swords with two edges. So really making use of both of them. And also, especially with the one-handed swords, where it can be sometimes difficult to throw that true edge ascending cut from the right. So from the dominant side, the mm-hmm. mandrito ridopio, there the false edge can really serve a nice and mechanically sound purpose. Yeah. How, how about you, Stephen? Yeah, the false edge is what it's all about, especially in the one-handed sword. Um, so I think the uh, 
The best test of somebody's skill with a one-handed sword is the facility with which they use the, their false edge. Um, and the false edge is great in so many ways, it um, I can't even go off on it enough. But basically, it's one of the key things that makes Bolognese swordsmanship Bolognese swordsman. Yeah, um, and it, it's interesting because like, there are so many different defensive mechanics um, but also offensive mechanics with that false edge, um, like what Martin was talking about. And there's a lot of creativity in using the false edge too. You know, I think about, um, you know, the there's a named action in particular, um, which is rising and falling. What is that in Italian, uh, Stephen? Oh, alza e tira. Elza yeah. e tira, yeah. Elza e tira. So that action we see um, both Manciolino and Marazzo talk about as being sort of this core component of Bolognese fencing is mm -hmm. the action of rising and falling. And it's rising with that false edge and then attacking with the true edge. And right. so it's like you're clearing your opponent's sword with the false edge, attacking with the true edge, rising right. and falling. And right. um, they talk about that as being a core mechanic. And of course, there's also like the core defensive mechanic. Um, but then from that would be that's typically done from your non-dominant side going towards your, your mm -hmm. dominant side. So it's going across your body. It would be from like, um, from Porta de Ferro Strada, which we'll talk about. Um, and so it's this kind of, it's think about having, um, where before we were talking the, the hip profile, it's like your hips are profiled off to the side mm -hmm. and you're going to turn with your mm -hmm. hip mechanics. So that way your, your heart goes facing away to facing towards your opponent as you're, you're kind of throwing this rising and falsing type action. Right. But there are, there are interesting uses of that same angle from the open position too, from Cota Lunga to uh, Cota Lunga yeah. Alta, looking to find both on the inside and the outside with the false head. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so we see a lot of attacks originate, um, especially from what we would consider low guards or mm -hmm. Cota Lunga Stretta right. specifically, um, start with either the false edge. Um, right. Manchilino gives us this moniker, and we'll talk about this again in a little bit, uh, where from those low guards, thrusts and falsos are really only your natural actions. So there's right. a lot of creative, there's a lot of creativity that's kind of baked into some of the attacks that they give with the false edge on that, on that dominant side, which is, is really fascinating. And I think it's important to emphasize what Martin said is that, that trying to cut with the true edge from the dominant side, um, again, creates that weak angle that we were talking about before. Yep. Um, because you're, you're kind of like, you're, you're compromising your structure coming up. Um, and so it becomes a really difficult cut. Plus it's a, it's a hard mechanic to kind of get the arm coming up, um, on, and through. So, um, that's, that's an interesting point. Yeah. I'll say two more things about the mechanics. And sure. that is that the turn of the body with a false edge cuts is especially important, especially if you employ them for your own defense, because they will generally close the line a bit later on right. the plus side, they will close the line really strongly. So you are generally collecting the blade, the opponent's blade, into the strong or into the hilt of your own blade, making you like getting into a really strong position if they don't hit you. So that makes mm -hmm. these right. uh, really interesting. And then from there, you can, of course, cut. Sometimes you can even thrust from these positions, especially if you're doing that falso manco, that false edge rising strike from your as a right hander left side to the right, so across your body then you often see as a next action an imbrocata or just another mandrito going back that same line. And if somebody tries to disengage your falso, then they all they do is they put their sword under your true edge, so it's just very easy to just push down and thrust. It's really hard to deal with well-thrown falso parry. Yeah, basically just going through that mandrito and falso manco motion, so always mm -hmm. keeping your true edge somewhat turned towards your own non-dominant side. So mm -hmm. for me, it's the left. It's really a nice way to learn fencing because you don't need to bother about turning the hand at all. You'll just have your most natural cuts, and then you'll just point forward. You have your punta reversa. Perfect. So let's talk about some other terms that we need to know regarding cuts. Mm -hmm. Some other of these uh, the qualifiers that we end up seeing or modifiers. So yeah, let's let's go ahead and kick it off with tondo. Um, Steven, do you want to take that? Yeah. So tondo just means circular. So. Um... And it is a cut that comes flat. Because if you think about it, when you throw your cut flat, um, by flat I mean horizontal, then it's going to naturally describe a circle. Yeah. 
So basically your flats are pointing towards the sky or towards the ground as Vijani describes it. And yeah, you can either throw these from your right or from the left. Vijani especially likes his basically rovescio tondo as a defensive action from where? You are land on your outside in a high guard. Well, thrust in Imbrocata. Yeah. And one of the great things about the Tondo is you can bounce the first one off an opponent's sword and then you can come back and throw the same cut even harder the second time. And if yeah. they don't defend wide and they do parry, you can just turn up your false edge at them and then poke them right behind their sword. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's a really then, great action to to cut around the opponent's blade as well if you displaced yeah. it. Yep. And then Manchielino gives us a really cool uh, add-on to that in his Strata section where he gives you a head fake. So you throw oh, yeah, that yeah, cut yeah. to the head fake. Yeah, make and them then, think Tondo. Like, yep. they, you make them think that you're going to cut around to the other side and then you right. come back and you hit them again with the same yep. cut. Yeah, that's it's super cool. It starts to feel like boxing, you know? Yeah. Like there's some kind of like hidden elements of this that are, you know, aren't, aren't fully like described. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's just basically the... The things that I would I would add from um, kind of looking at the sources here, um, it's described as a crosswise or traverse or sideways cut. Um, those are kind of the only like so it's just thinking of kind of like coming at it from like a sideways type type action. All right, so this is where we get into a little bit of controversy. I think we're gonna we might Ooh, have fun. to hash this one out. So nice. how about the squalum bro? Right. What is the <laughs> what's the uh, the squalimbrato for all the uh, the Murato folks out there? Yeah, so that would be your diagonal cut. So um, it's contentious on the exact angle, of course. But if you're somewhere between a tondo and a fedente, that's probably a squalimbro or squalimbrato. Yep. What do you yep. think? Um, so I mostly just study the anonymo, and he doesn't even bother describing squalimbro. So it's essentially. <laughs> If it's not described, <laughs> it's squalombrato. So if somebody says throw a mandrito, they mean throw a squalombrato unless they specify to do something. Right. And that's that's kind of the interesting thing is I'm wondering, and this is you know kind of getting into the, the weeds a little bit here, but is the squalombrato or the squalombro, as it's defined between uh, Delagoke um, and uh, Murato, as just a natural cut um, mm -hmm. in that... Uh, you have Delagoke saying, but one calls the squalumbro, which goes through diagonally, that is from the adversary's left shoulder to his right knee, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the reason I pulled out my um, <laughs> my tape measure Check is because angle. this is this is what I wanted to figure out. And this angle, at least on my body, uh -huh. is 60 degrees, Ooh. right? And so a lot of times, I think, especially amongst the HEMA community um, and like the cutting aspect of things, when people talk about target cutting, like traditionally in Japanese martial arts, the traditional target cut is a 45 degree cut. And that's how you kind of prove your proficiency with a sword. And so I think there's kind of been this like false baked in narrative, mm -hmm. uh, especially amongst the, the cutting community that, that maybe the squal and brato represents a 45 degree cut. Or something akin to that, maybe like more of like a fifty. So it's kind of like it's kind of like coming through at a more of a horizontal mm -hmm. mechanic. Um, but I don't see that, and I think Dalagoke is the only one who actually defines it. And by my calculations, it's sixty degrees plus. So it could be even more depending on your body type, um, because he says that it goes through the shoulder down through the knee. That's right. how he defines it. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure how much the cutting stuff applies to Bolognese swordsmanship since we always attack, or we're supposed to always attack fairly weak targets. There's not really a lot of body cuts. And, I mean, I haven't studied it, but I don't know how hard you have to hit an unarmored head with a sword to effectively do damage to it. That might be worth studying. Mm -hmm. But also, I've hit my own self with a sword and managed to mess myself up pretty hard accidentally. So I don't think that you have to hit somebody in the head with a sword very hard in order to get your cut to do something. What were you going to say, Martin? I also just want to add one mechanical point, and that is uh, more often than not, we are dealing with an opponent's blade and not only with their body. Exactly. And cutting from a bit more above tends to lead your sword to be above as well and not only being on the side. And being above especially if the hands are low, is generally a good position to be in. Right. Because if we really want to mess somebody up, we just want to stick them with the pointing. 
And it's more important, I think, just like Martin is saying, that it's more important that you land firmly on top of their sword and in control so you can you can threaten them with your point and they can't threaten you. Yeah, basically it's a mechanical advantage of their weak shoulder muscles against all of the weight of your upper body and also a geometrical advantage where their sword is sticking to their hand, which is sticking to their shoulder. So basically right. their range is described as a circle around their shoulder. So they have less reach below as you have above. What do you think, Joshua? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that um, in general, I do think, I think the Squalimbrato, as it's described, reminds me similar of Manchilino and, and the Anonimo kind of saying that, defining what a natural cut is. And it seems like it fits within that, that same mechanic. But I do think that there is ambiguity in terms of angulation of cuts depending on the target of the opponent. Um, I think you're always going to try... Um, you know, especially when you're attacking a horizontal target in particular, right? I think that you would want to go. So if you're like cutting at the neck or even mm -hmm. like trying to cut into the shoulders, you might cut more at a 70 degree angle. Um, but if you're cutting at somebody's arm, you know, maybe you want to cut more crossways. I'm not exactly sure. You might want to, you might have to create more angulation depending on how, what kind of wound you want to deliver to your opponent, um, and specific things. I think one of the most important things though, is not necessarily always the angulation of the, the cut, but more of making sure that you're following through and you're drawing through with your cuts. Um, so that's my, my biggest thing about like just cutting mechanics in general. Mm -hmm. So here's a wild theory. And uh, that is, what is your goal with that cut? If you like want to displace the opponent, like knock them over because they're in armor, right. then maybe a more horizontal cut would be right. appropriate because then they don't have the ground basically to support their body weight they get lifted off and they fly to the side like the german Twerhau, for example and if you really want to penetrate their armor maybe they are lightly armored then usually you want to cut at a steeper angle because then their body can't move out of the way that easily and you'll really cut into them or thrust into them with an imbrocata right. which is also where like the tatami mat cutting is way easier if you go at a steeper angle if as if you go, for example, from below, where you are basically throwing that tatami mat through the air, if you are hitting with a flat. At least. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with that. Yeah. So okay, so um, let's talk half cuts. Uh, mezzo. Half cuts. This seems half baked. <laughs> dun dun dun. <laughs> All right. Um, so what is a mezzo mandrito? What's a mezzo reverso, uh, Martin? Yeah, sometimes these are also referred as imperfect cuts in comparison to the full or perfect cuts. So, yeah, basically it's when you don't cut through your opponent, but you cut towards your opponent, leaving your hand and especially your blade in between your and your opponent. So this is way better if you only have your sword to uh, rely for for your defense. I think Manchulino talks about this as well, that mm -hmm. you should probably just do half cuts and especially if the distance gets closed and the opponent has their sword pointing towards you, then you'll probably want to leave your point in presence as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a, a good point, right? So if we were to describe like a perfect mandrito, we would almost describe it as going from a high guard to a, a wide guard, like a low wide guard, right? So it would be the Porta de Ferro Larga, which means our point would be pointing towards the ground. So our cut would go all the way through. And the length of that cut starts to narrow from the bottom to the top until it comes to the exact middle depending on our location of how close we are to our opponent right, right. so the closer we are to our opponent uh, the less our sword is going to travel whereas the closer we get to our opponent the more it's going to stop in that in that center line yep curiously the anonimo has one or more instances of a mezzomandrito that end in Porti di Ferro Larga in a wide guard with your point facing the ground. Now, he could have just <coughs> misspoke or miswrote, but maybe it just can also refer to a shorter cut. So that cut also starts from a high guard, or maybe does it start from a middle I think guard? it starts from a, a low guard. Okay, so from a so strata guard from, to yeah, a wide from, guard. Yeah, from the middle to the, to the low side, that would be a half cut as well. Yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. it, that's also called a half cut. Which is interesting because I think at later points he does define a half cut as something that leaves the sword in presence. So mm -hmm. one of the fun things of studying this is 
you know, they say things, but we shouldn't take them too exact. Yeah. So I've got, I've actually got a kind of a, a content or mm. sort of a counter theory to that, or Maybe. at least an okay. interpretation aspect of it. Okay. Um, when you are looking at a text, um, the end point of your guard tells you like, because you're always going to cut between two guards, right? So yeah. I'm going to start in one guard yeah. and I'm going to deliver a cut and it's going to go to another guard. Right. Um, so the finishing guard that I go to is going to be indicative of where my opponent is at. So a little bit later, we're going to talk about okay. measure, right? Sure. And if I try to attack my opponent with a mezzo and I'm just trying to give a half cut that controls the center, right? And my opponent takes a full passing step back, then I will let that cut travel through and it'll go into larga. And even though I cut a mezzo with the intent of it making a half cut, I'll let it go past and basically go wide because my opponent has fled. Unless you're trying to invite them, in which well, case you might throw to a wide guard for the express purpose of getting them to attack you. Right, but they would have to change measure in that, right? So a lot of times um, you'll see, like, Morazzo does this a lot. Like, he'll give these cuts that he says go into Porta de Ferro Larga um, with the sword alone, right? Which is really unique. It's the one, it is the one source that we have that actually shows a lot of wide play with the sword alone, right? Dalagoke uh. said... Dalagoke, well, okay, well, other than the Anonymo, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna say, well, well, I mean, okay. there's about two thirds of the Anonymo, but yeah, okay. Sure, we'll sorry. That. Uh, yeah. So, but like, you don't, you don't see it with Manchiolino, you don't right. see it with Dalagoke. Dalagoke right. mentions it, but he says that it's something that the ancients used to do. And he's talking right. about Manchiolino, Morazzo, right. and, you know, perhaps the anonymous author here. Um, but in general, we don't usually see those kind of things. Um, right. And like, uh, so, but that, that kind of like, deliberate use of of white actions and i think sometimes you can either interpret that as like marazzo is trying to give a provocation but he's usually telling you to attack your opponent in a specific way like um with the sword and large buckler for example one that comes to mind is he's attacking his opponent's sword arm with a fendente and he lets that fendente go to porta de ferro larga in my mind that's because the opponent recognizes that their hand is being attacked and they've stepped away so they've created okay. enough space that he lets that fendente finish in Porta de Ferro Larga, and then he goes with a wide play counter, which then he beats their sword and then cuts a reversal at their leg or whatever um, to sort of continue that that play. But I see that as like, you can almost read, when you're trying to figure out what the opponent is doing in the plays, you can almost read it through what does the guard end in, right? Sure. So if it ends in a wide guard, if it ends in a Larga guard, um, then a lot of times you can read that as your opponent is fleeing from you. You, right. Yeah, they're removing pressure rather than trying to remain in pressure. Right, because if yeah. it, if like Manchiolino gives this advice that you should always like step into your parries, that you should you should go right. forward in your parries, right. right? And if you were doing that, and Morazzo were to cut a fendente that went into Porta de Ferro Larga, that would be suicide, right? right. So obviously he's not fighting Manchiolino in this regard, because if he right. was, Manchiolino would stab him in the face and it would you know and and then we wouldn't we would have a, a text from sebastian marazzo and not <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so the mezzo cuts um you know i think martin to just kind of quote that manchialino quote that uh you referenced uh he says if you are near your opponent you should never swing a full blow because your sword should never go out of presence for your own safety the delivery of these half blows is called a mezzotempo, or sort of a half tempo, right? So it's a half cut and half tempo, and therefore it's smaller, and you can do it when you're closer to your opponent. Um, and we'll talk about why that is, and tempo and measure, and how they relate yeah. later. Yes, yeah, as I think as well. There's also like always the the possible interpretation of if it says then go to a larger guard, that it's just basically two consecutive actions. So you first cut into the line, and then you go wide, which Actually, if I think about it, Marazzo does on several occasions. Like he does uh, an action which usually maybe even uh, ends on your inside, and then the next guard would be on your outside. So there needs to be like if you cut a mandrito and you end in some coda longa guard, well, you need two motions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, last one that we'll see a lot, especially if people are looking at some of the small buckler material, whether it's the Anonimo, Marazzo, or Manchiolino. Uh, what is a montante? Ooh, stuff. 
Well, why don't you take this one, Steve? Yeah, He's enthusiastic right. about it. <laughs> Love the Montante. The Montante is great. So the Montante uh, simply just means first a directly rising blow. So the opposite of a fenton, right? So mm-hmm. if you can imagine, the cutting line would go up through the opponent's nards, or um, or where the nards would be if they are are uh, not a man, and uh, yeah, right up through the middle. And so it would go up there. Um, it's a really interesting blow, especially if you're using a buckler, because it will your false edge when you use that will pull any strikes in directly into the buckler. And so you can actually have a lot of fun with this. Try this if you have a buckler at home. Just walk directly at your opponent, making your arm make giant windmill motions uh, with your sword rising up next to directly up to your bu- buckler. It's very disconcerting for people who aren't used to it, and a ton. Yeah, have fun. And then I'm gonna just throw this out there. And then you can also transform that montante, as all the Bolognese authors do, or almost all of them do, into a thrust, which is so much fun. It's like uh, I've seen it described as you basically coming back for like you're rolling, like you're about to throw a bowling ball, and then you turn up and you drive a point right up into their uh, chest or something like that. Mm-hmm. What about you, Martin? What's your take on the montante? Yeah, I think you got it pretty good. It's it can be a really threatening strike to throw, especially if you have a buckler or another defensive implement. If you don't, you probably want armor. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, well, you probably it, do. Le- <laughs> it leaves your <laughs> upper body wide open. But actually, like in other sources like Pietro Monte, we see it with a two handed sword oh. and probably in armor. So it can be definitely a viable action. And I think he talks about turning it into a thrust as well. Mm-hmm. For Levada. Yep. And then, um, yeah, I think uh, interesting point here, Stephen, is uh, I think from Gordia Alta in the in the very first section of Manchialino in book one, when he's talking about how to defend against somebody in Gordia Alta, he says, oh, and oh, by the way, if you want just a general defense that will always work, you just throw a montante. montante. Yeah, throw <laughs> that goes into yeah. yeah, that goes back into Gordia Alta, right? It's... And he's like, this is just a generic defense you can always use, no matter always what your op- what attack your opponent throws, you can just do this. And right? also, and if you just make those time. windmills really fast and hard, people just, again, get very disconcerted, like, I, I yeah, it's, this doesn't it's just compute. Like spinning I haven't that. seen this before. It's a giant yeah. spinning... Yeah. I, don't, like, I don't know if you guys have ever fought somebody who does um, Godinho with two swords before. Uh-uh. It's no. terrifying. They're just spinning balls of death. Like, everything <laughs> about them is just like, there's always a sword coming at you, and it <laughs> nice. is the most terrifying thing. It's just oh. like... His whole con- thing, thing is just like stringing together these continuous attacks. That sounds like yeah, it's, so a, it's a really threatening bow, and just like the Imbrocata, it's also really hard to parry. Like, yeah. if you want to block that line, you, per definition, need to bring your own point offline. Right. Yep. Because and you'll you need to vulnerable. some way hold your sword in a horizontal fashion. And which that is, is a parry, which just allows your opponent to continue to attack you. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what yep. you can do to that is to go right back at them with a the montante and try to hit <laughs> their sword hand as it's coming up before they hit yours. So the only way to <laughs> the only way to stop it is to break all the rules and then get hit. <laughs> yeah. Moroso has a counter against the Montante too, but it's just to attack them before it starts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. not sure about that. Cool. cool.